Good evening, everybody. Good evening. This is wonderful to see so many of you here in 11. It's really um, a special occasion. I'm so excited for tonight's talk. As I'm sure a lot of you know, this sold out in just a few minutes. We've been looking forward to it for a really long time. Um, first off, how many of you have had a chance to go see the Constitution? Nice. Well, for those of you who haven't, I hope you get a chance to tonight. This is a really special opportunity for us here at Crystal Bridges to have uh, this special collection of founding original documents. For a lot of people, you know, they would say, what are a bunch of old documents doing in an art museum? But actually, I think this exhibition is perfect for Crystal Bridges. At Crystal Bridges, our mission, which Alice laid out for us, is to welcome all to celebrate the American spirit. And that is what I think this exhibition does, particularly in this patriotic part of the country. Earlier this year, we had Jeffrey Rosen, the uh, renowned author and the president of the US Constitution Center, come and speak. And he reminded us that it is the words in these documents that unite us. These are not stale archives. These are living, breathing documents that shape who we are as a people. They were designed to protect us, to protect our freedoms and our rights, and to put guardrails around the power of the state. And it can be hard to believe, now 250 years later, that many of these documents, particularly the Constitution, was just barely, barely ratified at the time. And I think it's particularly important to remember today in these deeply polarized times that as our current, as bad as our current ideological divisions might feel, those of our founding fathers were often deeper. And still, they were able to cast aside differences and work together and find compromise. So I hope this exhibition will remind all of us that we can and should find ways to work together. I hope We the People gives you and all of our visitors a sense of the values that unite us. I hope it is a reminder of what we share and what makes us great as a nation, while at the same time shining a light on some of our darkest moments and missteps as a country. So tonight's exhibition is a chance to do just that, to reflect on who we are as a nation, our values, our past, and our future. Now it's my great honor to introduce you to our speaker tonight, an American leader who has had to represent and defend these values on a global stage on behalf of all of us in this room. Secretary Condoleezza Rice was once named the most powerful woman in the world by Forbes magazine. It is hard to overstate what an incredible achievement that is. Secretary Rice grew up in the deeply segregated South in Birmingham, Alabama. With the support of her parents and community, she pushed boundaries, chased opportunities, and she worked incredibly hard. She was Stanford University's first ever female and first ever African American provost, also the youngest. And she was the first female national security advisor, as well as the first female African American secretary of state. Today, she leads the Hoover Institute, a public policy think tank at Stanford University, where she's focused on K-12 education in America and on launching the Center for the Revitalization of American Institutions. Joining Secretary Rice on stage is Ambassador Shireen Tahir Kelly. Ambassador Tahir Kelly is a senior fellow and the founding director of the South Asia program at the Foreign Policy School of Johns Hopkins University of School of Advanced International Studies. She was appointed by then Secretary Rice to be the first U.S. Ambassador for Women's Empowerment, as well as senior advisor on U.N. reform. Please help me give a very warm welcome to these two incredible, inspirational American women. Hello, Sharon. I think this is on. Yes. I believe right. it is. Yes. Well, this is my first trip to Arkansas, but what a reason to, to celebrate because you have heard a conversation that you will hear that shares the views of Secretary Rice. So I'm truly honored. 
Well, shall we? Let's begin. Shall we begin? Yes. <laughs> um, as I reflect back on things we've done together, uh, I was fortunate to have worked for Secretary Rice, both at the White House and at the Department of State. So she's used to my argumentative, hopefully somewhat convincing, <laughs> uh, style. But I would not have um, necessarily thought that a decade on, more than a decade on, that our conversation today on democracy, how to create it, how to sustain it, how to strengthen it, uh, would be in the sort of tumultuous phase that at least I, who am an American by choice, as I keep saying, and who, this is the shining city on the hill. So I would not have predicted that this is what the conversation we would be having uh, some 12 years on. So I just thought I'd start with sort of getting your sense of where we are, uh, on the messy road to democracy, as you describe beautifully in, the, in your book? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having uh, us here at this spectacular museum. Uh, I've heard so much about it, and it's just really exciting uh, to be here in this wonderful setting. And thank you for uh, bringing us together to talk about democracy, because um, I recently gave a talk at Stanford on uh, Constitution Day. In case you didn't know, there actually is a Constitution Day. I didn't know before I was asked to, to speak for one. Um, but uh, the American Constitution is more than 230 years old. And uh, yet, it has had this extraordinary evergreen character in that uh, it is a document, as sparse as it is, that has been able to channel the passions and the interests and the desires of Americans for now more than uh, 200 years. And so I started my talk by saying, uh, people ask me all the time, why do democracies fail, especially democracies in uh, young, young democracies across the world? And I always ask the opposite question, why do democracies succeed? This is a pretty strange idea that um, in, in the late 18th century that the founders had, that people could somehow self-govern through these abstractions called institutions, like constitutions and elections and courts, uh, rather than the way that people had pursued their interest for generations before, which was fight it out in the streets or be subject to someone who would tell you everything to do. And so it really isn't easy to imagine uh, that we would have succeeded for this long. Now, it's had its ups and downs, American democracy. Uh, certainly, um, after the founding, um, we the people didn't mean people like me. Uh, it didn't mean a lot of you out there who couldn't vote, and it certainly didn't mean me and my ancestors uh, were slaves. But I have a little story that I tell that uh, sort of brings it home to, to me, because the American Constitution, the first Constitution, counted my ancestors as three-fifths of a man in the compromise that allowed the United States to come into being. So in uh, January of 2005, I found myself in the Benjamin Franklin room of the State Department under a great big portrait of Benjamin Franklin, taking an oath of office to that Constitution to protect and defend it, sworn in by a Jewish woman Supreme Court justice named Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was my uh, neighbor at the Watergate. Yeah. And, and I thought to myself, what would old Ben have thought of this? <laughs> and I thought, you know, he's my favorite founding father, so I would like to think he would have liked it. But just think about that. In that 200 plus years, we'd gone from counting my ancestors as, the, as two thirds of a man to swearing in one of their descendants as Secretary of State by a Jewish woman. And so when we think about the ups and downs, it's very easy to think about the downs. But we also have to think about the fact that progress is not linear. It's a bit choppy, but it's moved for the large part in the right direction. And so I am optimistic 
about the future of American democracy, but I want to say one thing. It's not self-sustaining. My good friend George Shultz, who died at the age of 100 years old, used to write, wear a tie that said, democracy is not a spectator sport. And that is the lesson for all of us, which is that these are remarkable institutions. They have done extraordinarily well, but it's up to each and every one of us to meet its challenges every day. And so uh, that's, that's what I try to get my 19-year-old students to see, and uh, I think it's important for every American. That's a very important point that you raise, that, that, that in a, uh, it's not self-sustaining. You know, the Bill of Rights, the American Constitution, is the go-to document universally. When you talk about democracy anywhere, people talk about that. I mean, I grew up in Peshawar, Pakistan, knowing about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And enshrined in there, the freedom of speech, the, the, the sort of freedom to be, uh, or the safety from arbitrary rule, the need for consent to be governed, I think the, particularly those issues. So if you take that as the, uh, the code we've been given and talk about the responsibility of each of us to sustain it today, both here and in the larger sense, because democracy is democracy, lucky to have it, but when you don't have it, you want it. What particular things you think are the lessons learned that not only the things we should do, but the things we know that we shouldn't do, which is because I think sometimes that's just as difficult. Well, let's talk for a moment about what the challenges are to our democracy. Uh, as I said, more than 200 years, it's pretty remarkable. But I doubt that the founding fathers would have expected that this thing called Facebook, where Mark Zuckerberg just wanted to talk to his friends at Harvard. He didn't know he was going to be the the foundational uh, document of the country. And to think that that would be the way that the Russians would decide to uh, in, engage in and interfere in our elections. Okay, so founding fathers didn't see that coming. All right, so they didn't, they didn't know that there was this thing called social media out there. And look, I'm on social media, I like it, I think it's important. But if I could have a rule it would be that nobody in a position of authority gets to tweet or post anything until they have talked to somebody else and heard their views. <laughs> because the American democratic system, uh, as Madison said, needed constant contestation, he called it. Now, what did he mean? He meant that one day, I have a particular issue, and I might win on that issue. But the next day, I might need you on another issue, so I'm not going to try to kill you off. I'm not going to try to, to it's not going to be a blood sport. Uh, the next time, we might have to compromise on something. Now, if before you have bothered to talk with somebody that you might have to compromise with, you've already gone to uh, rev up your base you're not likely to compromise. I was saying to somebody who is working uh, in a campaign in Ohio, I said, you know, campaigns used to sound like this, and if elected, I will do this, and I will do this, and I will do this. And increasingly, they sound like this. If I am elected, I will stop them from doing this, and this, and this. That's the death of democracy, if in fact we can't somehow find a way to move together towards solutions. And so I would, I would change the, the social fabric a little bit in that way. The second point that I would make, another one that I always make to my students, is um, if you find yourself constantly in the company of people who say amen to everything you say, find other company. <laughs> now, um, when I was a kid, and I'm going to date myself now, uh, but I see a number of you out there who might know what I'm talking about. Um, my family watched the Huntley-Brinkley Report. Now, some people watched Walter Cronkite, some people watched Howard K. Smith. Um, a, late, a generation later, they would watch Brokaw and Jennings and Rather. But we had pretty much the same look at any issue. Now, I can go to my aggregators, my bloggers, my cable news channel, uh, my websites. I actually never encounter anybody who thinks differently. 
and when I do encounter somebody who thinks differently, I think they're either stupid or venal. And so somehow we have to learn to talk across our differences. And I, I say to my students, uh, look, you have to actually leave open the possibility that you might be wrong. Just because you think it, it isn't so. And so the second uh, prescription that I would have is that we, each and every one of us, make a pledge, a pact, that we're not going to live in our own uh, echo chambers, that we're actually going to listen to people from the other side. So that's two. One is our leaders don't get to uh, go to their base until they've thought about maybe compromising. The second is that we all take up the idea of not living in our echo chambers. And the final one that I have is really somewhat more granular. Um, democracy is, is about the Constitution and the institutions, but it's about more than that. Sharon, you know that when we would go around the world, we talked about one of the most important uh, webbings, if you will, uh, of democracy was actually civil society. So when de Tocqueville came to the United States in 1835, he was stunned by what he called these voluntary associations of Americans. He said they get into these voluntary associations just to do good. Now, today we would know them as boys and girls clubs and American Red Cross and Rotary Clubs, and they also are a fundamental part of democracy. And so, yes, voting is important, and yes, working in campaigns is important, but if each and every one of us, whatever issue is most important to you, you decided, I'm going to work on that. I'll bet 300 million of us doing that, we might actually make progress and not just leaving it uh, to the government to do. Well, I think you've just given us the Count Lisa Rice three rules of <laughs> civic behavior to promote democracy. But you, you know, as you articulate it, it makes absolute sense. Because the, the, the problem is not only the existence of these self-satisfying echo chambers, but it starts very young, and it goes all the way through the working of our national government where the need to compromise is so paramount, yes. or at least to get along. Yes. And you, you get that same resistance. So the, the, um, it makes a, absolute sense. The struggle will be how do you go from yeah. a, a, a young population that is so completely used to uh, living by social media in many, many ways, yeah. to bridging the divide with people on the other side, be it a political divide or an economic divide or social ethnic divide. But I think that is probably the challenge of our political leadership and also the challenge of our educational system. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, And it, it religious is. leaders and civic leaders and these wonderful institutions that are the backbone of America. And I think you talk about the importance of institutions and leadership in creating, sustaining, developing democracy. Has that kind of emphasis changed? Do we need to buttress some of that? Or what do you think? I, I'm one who actually believes that we have a lot of really fantastic public servants and leaders. Um, it, it's getting to be rather sad that um, I will stand in front of a, a class and I'll have four or five uh, students ask, well, should I even bother with public service? I mean, uh, and it, it's partly because we have so uh, defamed anybody who goes into public service. You know, we almost seem to believe if you go into public service, it's because you're self-serving. Now, I can tell you there are a lot of ways to get, a lot of better ways to get rich than to go into public service. All right. So uh, most of the people that I have met in public service have gone in because they want to do good. And yet, we aren't sending that message. Every article about public servants is about how self-serving they are and, uh, and the scandals. And that. See, it's not that we shouldn't report those, but could we once just realize that most people in public service are, are trying to do the right thing? And if you uh, continue to bring people into public service, 
um, you're going to strengthen that, that fabric. We also have a very good system of this in the United States, that people can go in and out. Uh, you don't have to stay in public service forever. I'm looking at my friend down here, Dan Bartlett, um, who here is uh, at Walmart as the vice president for, okay, whatever, uh, <laughs> but does government relations and communications. D Dan and I were in the White House together uh, for George uh, w. Bush. Neither of us had been in the White House before, and probably neither of us will be in the White House again. But we people go in and out. They go in and out from uh, academia. They go in and out from corporations and from business. And uh, that's something, if we can keep that circulation going, I really think it helps, because I don't think the founders ever expected that we would have permanent politicians. You know, they all uh, did their service, and then they went back to their farms and their state houses. Yeah. So I, I, like, I like the turnover idea, let me put it, put it that way. Yeah. Absolutely. I um, uh, noticed that there was a, a, a poll done that surfaced today about the fact that something like, I think it said 70% of Americans are worried about the state of democracy in America uh, and it's the way it's, where it's headed, uh, but are not particularly inclined to listing that as their main concern as we move towards the midterm and, and beyond. Yes. Um, does that make sense? Well, yes, because um, you know, people, people worry about what we used to call kitchen table issues. I mean, you know, if you're having trouble filling your car with gas to get to work, uh, if your kids are in schools that are not so great, and oh, by the way, they've had two years of learning loss because they weren't in school during COVID. Um, if you are um, wondering if you're going to be able to hang on uh, to your job because it looks like things are being automated out of your control, uh, the concerns about democracy seem somewhat abstract. And so I would suggest, rather than saying, well, people ought to be worried about democracy, that we make the link between those two. So how do we think about these kitchen table uh, issues and the exercise of democracy? And so if you are concerned about these things, actually vote. That's an exercise in democracy. Uh, find a candidate that you believe in and go and work for that candidate. How about you go and get yourself on a planning commission, a local planning commission, or a local school board? We sometimes think about democracy as, you know, the big uh, democracy, uh, big institutions that we, that we all revere, but democracy is at every level, and particularly in the United States, where, again, the framers gave us federalism. They understood that democracy was usually best exercised when it was closest to the people. And so, once again, what did they do? They put Washington, D.C. in a swamp between Virginia and Maryland, and they went back to the state houses where they thought everything was really going to happen. So, could we reinvigorate that sense of local governance? And I think when people are actually practicing local governance, you know, I had a really interesting experience. I, I stayed with some friends in Sudbury, Massachusetts for about six weeks a number of years ago. I was uh, teaching uh, at Harvard for a few, few weeks and I had a friend who was a professor at MIT and he was married to my best friend from graduate school. So I stayed with him in Sudbury. Sudbury still had a town hall form of government. Mm -hmm. And so I went with them a couple of town, times to these town hall meetings. And they were actually pretty bizarre. You know, I mean, people got up and talked about garbage collection, and they got up and talked about, you know, whether or not the parade was going to be allowed to take place because there was a ban on fireworks. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, it's kind of a waste, right? Then I thought, no, no, it's not. A collective, uh, the ability to collectively take on problems, no matter how small. And now when you think about it, if you want to think about that, waste issue, now you're having an effect on the environment and you're having an effect on our challenges of climate change. And so these local issues can add up and more than anything, it just gives people a sense of having control over their lives. 
Because one reason that people lose interest in politics and democracy and all of it is, it, it doesn't affect me. You've heard that. Uh, nothing that I do will it affect me. We've got to break, break that down. So, so is it that in some countries, the notion is one of democracy from the top, and for the U.S., it's, you know, sort of from the base? It's always meant to be, right, from the people. From the people. We the people. It didn't say we the founding fathers. It which is amazing. People, because which is amazing in, in the late 18th age, century. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. amazing in its own right. Yeah. 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 Um, Given that our Bill of Rights notes that uh, governments derive their power from the consent of the governed, what do you think today are the mechanisms for gauging that consent? Yeah. And are they in flux, or is this um, Well, the, the, the first and most important measure is how people vote. And, uh, and actually, um, when people vote, they can have an effect. We've seen that. Uh, fortunately, we've been having uh, not record turnout, but turnout that is far and beyond what we were having 10, 15, 20 years ago when people were really worried about turn turnout. And um, I often say that if people want to vote, they ought to be able to. And, and I, I concentrate on the vote because um, I think it was mentioned that I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, I was um, eight when we left Birmingham. Uh, sorry, 12 when we left Birmingham to move to Denver. But at eight, the civil rights um, legislation passed. Uh, first, the Voting Rights Act, and then what was called, the, first, the Public Accommodations Act, which allowed my parents and me to go to a restaurant for the first time in Birmingham, and then the Voting Rights Act. I can remember like it was yesterday, when I was six years old, uh, George Wallace was running for governor of Alabama. And um, my uncle had picked me up from school, and we were driving, and there were long lines of uh, black people, because everybody voted in segregated communities, long lines of black people, and they were waiting to vote. And I said to my uncle, well, Uncle Alto, if all these people vote, then that man Wallace can't possibly win. And you were 12? I was six. Six? Right, yes, I was observant. <laughs> and uh, my, my uncle said, oh no, he said, we're a minority. Wallace is going to win. And I said to my uncle, so why do they bother, meaning the people in line? And he said, because they know that one day that vote will matter. Right? And I never forgot that. Mm. That even in circumstances where people had no earthly reason to believe that their vote was going to matter, they exercised the vote. So I have very little tolerance for people who complain about politics and then don't vote or complain about politics and say, oh, well, you know, I waited in line for a really long time. Have you ever watched the lines in places like Iraq and in places like South Africa when they're getting, they will stand there for a day in order to, the vote is such a privilege. And so I start with the vote and I go from there to um, civic engagement um, and, and, you know, the letter to the congressman and all of those things that allow you to gauge uh, Public opinion polls, I think, are a little bit more fraught. Um, I, you know, I don't know how many of you have landlines these days, but certainly none of the pe people that I teach have landlines. So if you're a pollster calling on landlines, uh, you're not likely to get a very representative sample. Yeah. Stepping back a little to the concept part, um, it is said that democracy equals freedom. Are they the same? No, they're not the same. Um, democracy is the institutionalization of freedom. Uh, democracy cannot exist without freedom. And freedom won't last very long if it's not institutionalized. What the founders understood was that um, human freedom is a great thing, but unless you channel it in some ways, uh, it can simply be the will of the mob. And so they were very determined to deal with two things, and we're, they're coming back around now in discussion. One was they were very determined uh, to have representative government because you could not every day ascertain what the will of the people was. So you had to have representatives of that. Now, I'm a Californian these days. We have these referenda. 
I was just reading my voter guide on the way out here. It's this thick. We're trying direct democracy. Doesn't work so well. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, when I read these referenda, I, I'm a pretty educated voter, and I can't tell you what I'm voting for. And I start, start reverting to, OK, so who that I like, actually? So that's not really very good. So they understood that representation was an important way to gauge the interests of people. So that was the first way in which freedom became encased in institutions, which is what democracy is. The second, and we're having a, quite a debate about this, was they didn't want to give way to the tyranny of the majority. And so uh, this has come in the form of the Electoral College and the debates that we're having about the Electoral College. Because uh, if you just voted by population majority, uh, certain coasts would dominate. The middle of the country would have not terribly much to say about anything. And so they created that system. They also created a system in which you would have population represented in the House of Representatives, but every state would have two senators where you could have deliberation that didn't go directly to what the state's interests were. So it's a very carefully designed system. And when I hear people wanting to pick pieces of it apart, I say, you know, be careful what you wish for, because they really did think through this issue that you don't want the tyranny of the majority. But then, given the uh, um, discomfort or disenchantment of what's called middle America, how does that play out? That certainly wasn't the planned uh, scenario as the Founding Fathers worked, but how do we adjust so that there is a sense of inclusiveness, because the, I think democracy does it require inclusiveness, not regional, ethnic, uh, otherwise? Well, uh, yes, uh, but I do think, I think different parts of the country are being heard in uh, their own way. Um, I, I, I frankly don't love um, the cults of personality that we see forming uh, in the country. I don't personally love celebrity politics uh, terribly much. But uh, people are finding their voice with candidates that they believe represent uh, their interest. The responsibility, though, of those candidates to actually represent those interests really rather than simply becoming a kind of vessel for discontent. That's really a lot of the problem. And uh, these days, um, and maybe it's the, the effect of, of uh, again, the way we get our information and media and so forth, uh, you know, nothing can get you more attention than sitting on a television set and yelling your head off about how bad somebody else is, right? And that's just not really healthy. Um, we've always, uh, a friend of mine who's a political scientist says, polarization isn't the problem, all right? We've always had people at different polls. Demonization is the problem. If everybody who disagrees with you, it's, uh, they are morally corrupt, they are anti-democratic, it, just think about the way that we describe political differences these days. We describe them in ways that are zero-sum, in ways that are blood sport. I can't just disagree with you about school choice. Right? Um, if I disagree with you about school choice, which I favor, by the way, uh, somehow you are morally corrupt. That language, uh, that posture, is really not healthy for democracy. And I think we have to be more demanding of our leaders that they don't engage uh, in that. And we certainly shouldn't reward it. Thank you, because I think that's a very, very important um, distinction uh, that, that you've just drawn, because we are both extremely judgmental as well as polarized. And the giving the other person the benefit of the doubt that maybe they, they, they are, they, their life's experiences leads them to look at the same problem of different ways, simply not accept it. And you know, I've been in the United States since 1959, so much of my life. 
And, and I've seen the arc of this, which startles me because I still am a little naive and it's still the city on the hill because everything else crumbles faster around us in the world. So it seems more important that we get it right here. So I think what you've said about sort of um, learning to cope with the differences and, and managing them. Yes, and, and it, it can start on a personal level. Um, there, there's another part of this, which is that, uh, again, a historian friend of mine says, you know, when you don't know history, everything is unprecedented. And uh, we, we do suddenly have this um, hyperbole about everything, right? It's unprecedented. It's apocalyptic. It, you know, it, it back off a little bit, right? Now, uh, let's, let's just have a, a conversation. And I'll give you uh, an example of this. So Americans are losing confidence in their electoral system. We not, know that from surveys. Well, if you yell voter fraud, voter suppression, you mean to stop the conversation, not start it. And it may well be that there are things about our electoral system that make absolutely no sense in the way that we do it, but we can't have that conversation if you immediately go to the most extreme language about it. We can also practice this as individuals. Uh, another line that I have with my students is, uh, you don't have a constitutional right not to be offended. So if you are offended, how about you turn to the person next to you before you organize the university on White Plaza, before you start a major protest? Uh, if you were offended, how about you turn to the person and say, you know, that was offensive. And let me tell you why that was offensive. And then you can have a conversation about it. And as you said, you can give the other person the benefit of the doubt. Because heaven knows there's going to be a time when you need the benefit of the doubt because you're going to offend someone. And so both in our personal interactions and in our civic engagement uh, as, a, as a corporate body, uh, we, we do have to back off a little bit of the extreme rhetoric and uh, the hysteria that sometimes accompanies almost every political difference. What, what would be the role of our educational system? Because for one thing, I uh, see that in many, many good school districts, otherwise noted as good, the teaching of civics has disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. So are there, is it time to sort of think about, I mean, we're not, the society that's going to socialize its kids. But on the other hand, understanding the rules of the game seems to me uh, to be an important. It, it, even component. understanding the history, understanding what the institutions are. Um, you know, you, you've probably watched those, you know, man on the street things, you know, how many people are there in Congress? Oh, I know, 50? I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of sad. I've often thought that if Americans had to take the citizenship test, uh, you know, none of us, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have 330 million citizens, that's for sure. And, and so, um, yes, uh, it is starting to take hold in uh, universities at Stanford. We actually now have a track called the citizenship track in which uh, students are studying different conceptions of citizenship and uh, where does it come from and what does it mean. And so there's a little bit of a pendulum swing in the educational system to, to go back to studying some of, of the basics. Um, and so maybe that will continue. Uh, we at, at Hoover, we've been doing some work on perhaps helping to create curriculum um, for, a, for high school uh, teachers, just units about uh, elements of the founding or what, what, what did produce the Bill of Rights, what, that kind of thing. So I think there's a little bit of a swing. Um, Sandra Day O'Connor, before her death, was very much uh, a proponent of this, and she created organizations which I think are having some effect on getting people to say, if you don't understand your democratic institutions, you can't exercise them very well. Right, and, and maybe it's a good thing to move it to middle school, because sometimes by the time it's high school, kids are busy with other things, and we might. But I'm very delighted to hear that 
maybe this would lead to some kind of a waking up on the curriculum issue. Well, I uh, hope so, because uh, you, you really don't want to start teaching uh, third and fourth graders that the institutions that are going to govern them and that they are going to use to pursue their interests are not worthy because if you're on one side of the political spectrum, they're dominated by those elites that don't believe in your values and are trying to take away your X, Y, Z. And on the other side, they're so corrupted by the history of slavery that you really shouldn't pay any attention to them. All right, so if you're a third grader and you hear that and that's all you hear, what do you think about uh, your, the prospects for those uh, institutions? And so uh, it doesn't mean that you don't teach the history uh, as it was. I, I took um, Alabama state history in fourth grade. The textbook was called No Alabama. And um, let's just put it this way. I don't think there were slaves in Alabama at any time in <laughs> Alabama's history, according to No Alabama. So, um, yes, we need to correct the historical record. And, you know, my ancestors were slaves. Actually, they were also slave owners. And so our birth defect of slavery uh, is a very tough one to deal with. And there comes a time you need to make sure that kids are, I think, old enough to deal with complex concepts like race, you know, when they're seven years old, I'm sorry, they're just trying to figure out what it is to be human. And the fact that Johnny looks different is, they'll come home and they'll say, you know, Johnny's dark, is, why? And you say, well, Johnny's of another, another race, yeah, fine, okay, but I still like Johnny. Uh, you know, we don't really need that early uh, to start complexifying these, these issues. There will come a time when you want the history to be uh, related in a way that is, uh, is truthful, but also balanced. Uh, you want, as modern people, uh, to not always try to impose the mores of the 21st century on people who lived in the 19th century or the early 20th century. Uh, because human beings, what history teaches us is human beings are kind of imperfect. And uh, yes, Thomas Jefferson was, um, had many contradictions in his life. Uh, we often think about the one in which, you know, uh, the, the great words about all uh, men are created equal, and he was a slave owner. He had other contradictions. He, he wrote about how the professional army was a threat to Republican values, and then he founded West Point. <laughs> so, you know, the guy was on both sides of a lot of issues. Okay, there are people like that. But it doesn't mean that Thomas Jefferson isn't worth lauding for what he bequeathed to this country. And so um, I think in the way that we teach history, I mean, I studied countries that wipe out their history, and it doesn't end very well. And so, Yes, teach the history, but teach it in a way that is balanced, teach it in a way that is truthful, and introduce it to kids at the right time in their lives when they can, when they can uh, process these rather challenging concepts. If, if I might uh, sort of switch a little bit the angle um, and look abroad, uh, you had the uh, unique sort of opportunity and experience uh, of seeing events up close that led to the Orange Revolution and all, all that Ukraine, followed. Yes. So I wanted to ask what, how you see Ukrainian democracy. I mean, yes. at the moment, it's about survival. Yes, it is about survival. Um, but it, the reason the survival becomes, I think, important and critical is because of what it represents. Absolutely. So yes. any, your thoughts on, on that would be great. Well, when I look at what the Ukrainians are willing to die for, uh, the liberty that we get up every morning and enjoy because somebody bequeathed it to us, I really, I'm, I'm done with grumpy Americans, right? I mean, we should just really be so grateful when we watch what they are doing. 
And two things are happening in Ukraine. Uh, they are fighting for uh, democracy. As you know, it wasn't a perfect democracy before this war. A lot of corruption, a lot of infighting among the politicians and the like. Uh, but the other thing that is really happening is Ukraine is being really forged as a nation out of this war. Uh, now it doesn't matter if you lived in Eastern Ukraine and spoke Russian or Western Ukraine and spoke Ukrainian. You feel Ukrainian, and that is going to last. And that was the big mistake that, that Vladimir Putin made. Uh, he honestly believed his own rhetoric, his own narrative. He, he told us, uh, Ukraine is a made-up country. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, many Russians don't recognize that the Ukrainians are a distinctive people. They speak a distinctive language. I speak very good Russian, but if I try to speak Ukrainian, I'll make all kinds of mistakes because the languages are not the same. And so he didn't understand that this was really a nation. And he, his own deluded view of history was, well, they had only been independent a couple of times in their history, which is true. But now they are really being forged as a nation. So um, if they can survive this, and I think they will survive it, um, I don't know how it ends, but I, they will survive, and they will survive as a stronger, more democratic nation than I would ever have guessed uh, when the Orange Revolution uh, happened in 2004-05, uh, or it, when they became independent after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So it's, a, it's extraordinary to watch this happening right before our very eyes. Yeah. I've, I've heard you say that there comes a time in every revolution where a large number of people are no longer afraid of their government. Is that what's happening in Iran, in Russia? Yeah, it's certainly happening and in Iran. And maybe in Afghanistan. Yeah, it's certainly happening in Iran. Uh, you know, we, again, this is a discussion about democracy. And I, I hear sometimes, oh, well, you know, those people don't have a tradition of democracy or they don't care about democracy. And it's always said by people who are lucky enough to live on the right side of history, right? Those people in the streets of Iran, those people fighting in Ukraine, they know that democracy is the only system in which human dignity is fully achieved. They know that. They know it in their heart, in their gut. And so, yes, you can't impose democracy. You hear that. But you actually don't usually have to impose democracy. You impose tyranny. And then what happens to the tyrant? So what is the tyrant's only way of control? It's lies and coercion and fear. And if any of those begin to break down, the tyrant is face to face with his people. That's what's happening in Iran. People are losing their fear of the besieged, the, the uh, militias that run the streets, of the religious police. They're losing their fear of the ayatollahs. Now, they may crack down again, but with each successive time, that regime gets weaker. And when you look at tyrannical regimes, remember that they look solid until they're not. And there's a story that I think Shirin is referring to. Um, we were in Romania um, and in 2005, and they were telling us the story of Ceausescu and how, as revolutions were happening all over Eastern Europe, uh, Ceausescu came into a square with 250,000 people, and he was telling the Romanians all he'd done for, him, for them. And all of a sudden, one old woman yelled, liar. And then 10 people, and then 100 people and then 10,000 people, and now 100,000 people are chanting liar. And he turns to run, because he realizes that all of a sudden they've lost their fear of him, and now he's just face to face with their anger. And the young military officer who was to fly them to freedom flew them instead back to the revolution where he and his wife, Yelena, were executed. The Ceausescu moment comes for every authoritarian regime. Because their greatest fear is not of each other, it's of their people. Dem democratic, you know, d democratic leaders have a fingertip feel for their people, and they're, they're afraid of not getting reelected, but they're not really afraid of their people because they know that there's a peaceful way to change power. There's no peaceful way to change power if you're Xi Jinping, if you're Vladimir Putin, if you're the Ayatollahs in Iran. And that's terrifying if you're an autocrat. Do you want to do that question? Um, yes. I think
think we still have. Oh, we have. Okay, all right. We have a couple questions up here. I just want to make we sure have, we, we have get a few them. Minutes all right. Switch over. Right. Um, it would be sort of. I think I, I want to raise the issue of uh, the the U.S. effort towards uh, the f freedom agenda, democracy promotion after 9/11, and we made headway. Yes. At that point, there were 45 democratic countries. Yes. Today, the numbers dropped to something like 23, apparently. Yeah. So it, it, what happens, when we, one, one did see progression. We even had an Arab Spring. Was it, do you think it was a one-off event? Or are we likely to kind of, it's out there and it takes time and it's back and forth, as you said? It, it's, it's never a straight line. It's, uh, you know, it's more like a stepwise function. You get, you go like this, and maybe you go back a little bit. But to just expect it to be a straight line is, is a mistake. And, and, uh, and, you know, I question the 45 to 23. I'll tell you, I look at some of these uh, indices. And uh, if you look at Hungary, absolutely, it's gone back to authoritarianism. If you look at Poland, there are still democratic institutions, a press that will report on things. Uh, when there was a, uh, a referendum on uh, the issue of uh, abortion, uh, the government lost its position. Uh, so I think there are, uh, we, we have to be careful in saying that. How about that Brazil? I think Brazil is gonna have an election. Uh, they've had the first phase. Uh, Bolsonaro is uh, a populist, all right? So populists are not anti-democratic, but they are anti-institutional. They get elected, they want to get elected, but they say, those institutions, they're not for you. So come directly to me. I can, I'm the one who can save you, and that's, that's Bolsonaro. But will he win? I don't know. And so, uh, by the way, when I used to teach something called the role of the military in politics as a young faculty member in the 80s, I could always talk about some Latin American junta. There were several to choose from. There really aren't any today. Uh, I couldn't find, uh, with the exception of Japan, an Asian democracy. There are several of them today. African democracy, oh, they were too tribal. There are several of them today. And so uh, I think we have to be a little bit careful in talking about the democratic recession. There's no doubt that we didn't get the straight line. Some democracies failed. Some uh, spectacularly so, like Turkey. But um, let's wait and see what the judgment will be in a few years of those regimes. We tend to measure history in four-year increments. That's right, very, very so short So for us, 20 years is what? Four administrations, yes. uh, it's yes. not, not easy. Um, it would be difficult to end this conversation without some um, reference to Afghanistan, where um, I remember the excitement of the 2004 yes. uh, constitution that enshrined the right of women to work, to be educated, and it did lead to tens of thousands and of very qual highly qualified women who are there. Yes. I mean, they may not be given uh, the opportunity to see the light of day right now, but how do you see this playing out? And now, quite apart from the Russian, US, regional issues, you also have China breathing down everybody's yeah. necks up there. Yeah. So let me talk about a few of these, uh, these places. I, I think you've, you've probably seen by now, I'm, I'm unabashedly um, a believer in the universality of democratic principles. I really ask, I believe if you ask people, do you want to say what you think, worship as you please, be free from the knock of the secret police at night, and choose those who will govern you, they will say yes, that there are no people on the earth who want to live in tyranny. And I'm an unabashed believer that the United States is an imperfect democracy, but still its greatest uh, triumph. Uh, given how complex we are and given how, uh, how long we have taken to get to where we are. And that leads me to the question of what America's role is in these places that you've talked about. Because if anybody should be patient about how hard it is to move from family and tribe and violence in the streets to those democratic institutions, it should be us. 
we're still trying to get it right. We still have days like January 6th, when, thank God, the system holds, but where we're challenged. And so how should we be so insistent that others have to do it in, well, if they haven't done it in 20 years in Afghanistan, oh my goodness, they failed. Well, where were we 20 years after our founding? Yeah. Not in such great shape. I remember right? that. That's a very important So uh, I remember, Shirin, just a small little story. So I was testifying before Congress about the Afghan Constitution, and some senator said, so uh, how about this really bad compromise that says both Islamic, Islamic values and individual liberties? And I said, well, you know, it's actually not as bad as the compromise that made my ancestors three-fifths of a man. So maybe we could actually um, give others a little bit of a break. And so we, we, we need to be more patient. Afghanistan is a case of not being patient. Uh, we, it was not uh, that difficult to keep a few thousand American forces plus some thousands of allied forces in Afghanistan to give the Afghan people a chance to defend themselves against the Taliban. In pure strategic terms, if you asked yourself, would we like to have military bases in a country that has a 900-kilometer border with Iran, the most troubling country in the region? You might say, yes, that's strategically a good idea. And oh, by the way, it wasn't our longest war. Our longest war is Korea. We are still in an armistice in Korea. We still have 23,000 American forces in uh, South Korea because we don't think that the 500,000 man sophisticated South Korean army can deter that crazy man to the north. And would anybody be unhappy about the stability that we've bought in uh, Northeast Asia? By the way, it took South Korea a long time to be a democracy. It was a military dictatorship during that period. So we lost patience, and I feel most responsible for the women of Afghanistan because they believed us. They believed you can come out of your burqas. They believed you can join the Air Force. I met women police officers. They believed send your girls to school. And credibility is not, div not divisible. We will pay for that decision for a very, very long time to come. It was the wrong decision. It's done now. I hope that we find a way to help the Afghan people keep even a little bit of the freedom that they have. I want to close with China because um, sometimes, you know, they're having their big party congress uh, this, this week. Um, where Xi Jinping is going to be, um, uh, I guess, uh, coronated for a third term. Uh, the Communist Party of China had solved two big problems. Too many presidents for life and uh, too many people who stayed well beyond the age at which it was appropriate. So they had term limits. Xi Jinping's given, done away with, with term limits. Now, I sometimes hear, even from some of our leaders, let me call it authoritarian envy. They build great airports. They get so much done. Democracy is so messy. Look at what China is doing. Well, let's look at what authoritarians do. Uh, anybody heard of zero COVID? Oh, that was a great idea. And it has so crashed the Chinese economy that they are refusing to publish their GDP figures. So something's gone really wrong there. Oh, by the way, a few decades ago, that one child policy, how'd that work out? 34 million Chinese men don't have mates because a lot of girls disappeared. If you were gonna have one child in the villages, you wanted a boy. Sometimes what authoritarians do is because there's a single point of failure they take really bad decisions. Democracies rarely, you know, sometimes we can't get our act together, but we really, rarely take really bad decisions because there's always some veto group that's going to stop it. So the next time somebody tells you how, how strategic the Chinese are and how incredible uh, they are, just think to yourself, uh, they've made some really, really bad decisions as of late. And it'll be interesting to see uh, whether or not Xi Jinping, whose policies have probably uh, stunted Chinese growth uh, well below what they need to keep people happy. And there's one final point about that. 
As the Chinese uh, population is younger, more educated, uh, more worldly, what will they want of their government? Right now, what they want is they want access to uh, the internet, such as it is, and they actually love kind of Western cultures. So funny little story to, to end. You will remember when uh, the NBA, the uh, Houston uh, general manager, spoke out about, um, about Hong Kong, and the Chinese said, we're going to kick the NBA out of China. And I called Adam Silver, and I said, Adam, they're not going to kick you out of China. I said, because those young princelings, those spoiled only children in China, those well-educated young people, you know what? They are not going to watch the Chinese national team play the Kazakh national team for very long. <laughs> they want to see um, LeBron, and they want to see Steph. And so the Chinese have a kind of literally tiger by the tail. We'll see. We'll see how well they do. But um, authoritarians uh, eventually come to the end of the road one way or another. Our time is up, but I'd like you to briefly ask your, your mic. Uh, your, the question <laughs> that was on here, as, uh, which has disappeared, but I think it's a very important wrap-up of uh, what we're saying. And the question was, you mentioned how to get beyond the echo chamber and create a if not a dialogue, at least the beginning of an interaction. How precisely can one do that? Yeah. Each and every person commits to reading something or talking to somebody with whom you disagree. And not talking so that you can, in the first order, persuade them, but so that you can actually hear them and that you might actually then understand where they're coming from. You might still disagree at the end of the day, but at least you'll have a better sense, and you will have established that uh, with that person that you can have a civil conversation. I read uh, every morning uh, online. I read all of my newspapers online, and I probably read five or six newspapers every morning. And I make myself read the columns of people who are going to get my blood pressure up, right? <laughs> I know I'm going to read that column and I'm going to think, how could you think such a stupid thing? But I'm going to read it and I'm going to try to step back and I'm going to try to see if there's anything in there that might make sense to me. It doesn't mean that you compromise on your principles. But again, it goes to the uh, extreme language. If everything's a matter of principle, then we have nowhere to go. Sometimes it's just a different interpretation of principle, and we call that a policy difference. And if we could learn to know the difference between a policy difference and a matter of principle, we might be a better democracy. Thank you very much, Dr. Rice. Thank you for that. <laughs>